think we're ready to go. Uh, my name is John Cleveland, and along with my colleague, Amy Longsworth, we staff the Boston Green Ribbon Commission, a network of CEOs supporting the implementation of the City of Boston's Climate Action Plan. This is one of our GRCX series, an interactive uh, program to share share information across our networks on climate resilience and carbon mitigation. Um, we have a great uh, panel today. Um, it's a set of Boston-based innovators with really, really extensive experience in municipal and real estate finance, all of whom are on the leading edge of figuring out how these markets need to uh, integrate climate risk into the way that they operate. Um, uh, the panelists, you can next slide, please. Uh, first up is going to be David Burke. He's the CEO of Delta Terra Capital. He has more than 20 years of experience helping institutional investors get the most out of their real estate and structured finance investments. Um, before founding Delta Terra, he was a partner and portfolio manager at Wellington Management Company. And prior to that, he built investment processes at several companies, including BlackRock and State Street. We actually got introduced uh, to um, Dave because he's a trustee for the Boston Children's Museum and also it turns out he's establishing a foundation to help preserve climate stability for future generations. So uh, climate work is clearly um, in his blood. Uh, next up will be Tim Coffin. He's Senior Vice President and Director of Sustainability at Breckenridge Capital Advisor, which is the largest independent investment advisor in Massachusetts, more than $38 billion of assets under management and a major um, purchaser of municipal bonds. He's helped lead the introduction of Breckenridge's environmental, social, and governance capabilities to clients. And prior to Breckenridge, he was vice president at Fidelity Investments, where he launched and managed the firm's municipal finance group with Fidelity Capital Markets. <clears throat> Evan Condra is co-founder and CEO of Risk. It's a, uh, a Boston-based startup, a spin-out, a National Science Foundation spin-out from Northeastern University. And it's focused on catalyzing socially responsible climate action through data and analytics in the financial sector, including the U US municipal bond and real estate markets. He's a statistician and climate science whose research has been cited by the IPCC. And last but not least, we have Drew Smith. He's the department head of treasury for the city of Boston. And uh, I think you might say he's, he's in charge of everything financial at the city. Uh, including the management of revenue and distributions, the city's long-term debt, trust funds, and oversight of Treasury statutory and regulatory requirements. Um, he joined Boston after having been Deputy Assistant Treasurer of Debt Management at the Massachusetts State Treasury, where he managed over $25 billion in outstanding debt and also uh, managed the um, issuance of the Commonwealth Green Bond transaction. So um, we have a great uh, panel. And before we jump into it, just a couple of logistical notes. Um, we will have about 25 minutes at the end of this um, panel uh, for Q&A. And if you have questions, please put them in the chat uh, box. And we'll use the chat box to collect the questions um, and facilitate uh, the Q&A at the end. And, uh, and second, um, within a few days um, of this event, um, you will be getting an email that will include uh, two things. One, it will include a link to the video and the slide presentation, and it will also include a link to a short survey uh, to provide us some feedback um, on that. So um, with that, um, we'll jump into it. And uh, Dave, you're up. All right. Well, thanks, John. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be able to participate today. I'm really grateful for the opportunity and for all the great work uh, you and the Green Ribbon Commission are doing for the city. Um, I'm the CEO of Delta Terra Capital, which is a new investment research firm uh, focused on measuring the impact of increasing climate hazard risks on real estate capital markets. Um, as John mentioned, I'm also a trustee for the Boston Children's Museum and really looking forward to helping the GRC and the city in any way I can as we tackle our own responsibilities in the coordinated resilience effort. Uh, for the last 20 odd years, I've been helping clients navigate real estate capital markets as an institutional investor. And my current research suggests that we are facing one of the biggest mispricing issues in history around climate. 
In the next 15 minutes, I'll cover the basics of climate risk analysis and why I think we are on the brink of a dramatic and necessary adjustment to the way people think about this increasingly apparent problem. Then I'll hand it off to the real experts and Tim, Evan, and Drew to take us through specific implications for muni planning and policy and the resilience effort in Boston specifically. Uh, next slide, please. While people have been thinking at a high level about the impact of global warming on hazard risks for many years, I personally started feeling like I had a real chance of someday being able to explicitly measure these risks in 2014 when the International Panel for Climate Change, the IPCC, conducted the CMIP-5, um, or the fifth phase of the Coupled Model Intercomparison Project. Um, this is uh, involved aggregating climate model simulation outputs from 20 of the most advanced climate science research groups across the entire globe. Um, and then making all of that data available to the public, which was great. Importantly, all of the research groups were given the same four hypothetical greenhouse gas emission scenarios and all of the outputs, temperature, precipitation, et cetera, were collected using standardized definitions. This really allowed for the next really important breakthrough, uh, a concept known as downscaling. Essentially, because all of the models provided outputs for slightly different geographies and at different resolutions, the combined output can be used to estimate forecasts at a higher level of location precision than any single model. While this is a complex and somewhat tedious exercise, many powerful applications for downscaling have been produced by the research community and are now made available in the public domain for those that know where to look. Over the last few years, we've seen many outstanding nonprofit and for-profit efforts to then take these location-based forecasts and work them into analyzing hazard risks. It's tempting to lump all of this work into a process I learned about from Evan, and he's gonna talk more about it, um, the climate conditioning of traditional catastrophe models. So CAP modeling has historically relied on backward looking actuarial methods uh, that assume a constant risk over time. Now that we know that these risks to be trending, a new approach is necessary and that's where geniuses like Evan and his team come in. <laughs> they use advanced modeling and engineering techniques to measure rational expectations for building damages in a particular climate scenario both today, adjusting for known climate trends, unlike traditional CAP models, and into the future. We're now entering into a new phase of climate risk analysis that's particularly, particularly relevant for real estate investors, including local governments given both direct real estate ownership and tax base exposure to asset value trends. The hazard loss estimates that are coming out of the scientific work we've been discussing are particularly useful in thinking about how to price a typical one-year insurance contract and in thinking about how insurance rates might rationally increase going forwards. They don't quite get us to valuation risk. Since real estate asset valuations are actually based on cash flow expectations for many years into the future. That is where Delta Terra comes in to help investors walk that last mile from scientific hazard rate expectations to capital markets impacts in an uncertain world. So next uh, slide, please, Claire. As I mentioned for hazard costs, that they're deducting from their ongoing expectation for revenue or utility. Typically, this is just their current insurance premium. The question we are answering for investors is, what would be the impact on asset values if buyer expectations for these hazard costs approach the scientific estimates for damage rates? Basically, that would happen, what would happen to values if all of a sudden we were all forced to pay into some scientifically priced national insurance scheme to cover our hazard risks. While this is a naive case and the actual ways in which climate hazards are paid for is much more complex, I think it is just as likely that buyer expectations overshoot rational expectations when things start to change. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> 
Here's a simplified description of the model framework we're using to solve the problem, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. It's complex. Uh, we start by using public and private insurance pricing data to make an educated guess as to what a property buyer expects to pay for climate hazard protection today into the future. Uh, we then use a hazard cost estimate from risk, um, Evans firm, or, or some others to estimate what a potential buyer should expect to pay. Then we use straightforward real estate valuation techniques to estimate the impact on values. We go one step further in measuring the anticipa anticipated impact of the rationalization event on debt performance and also more com complex capital structures, but I'm not gonna get into that part today. Um, I guess if there's mortgage derivatives geeks out there that wanna go into the application of this process on CMBX tranches or something, you can get my contact info from John. <laughs> um, the uh, next slide, please. All right, here's an example that should serve as illustrative. Uh, the example is an average single family rental property that produces an annual rent of 25,000 a year and pays 2,500 a year for insurance and 7,500 a year in other costs. Uh, this leads to a net operating income of $15,000 a year. All of the real estate folks on the call know this, uh, but for others, it's important to know the industry standard formula for valuing an infinite stream of property net operating incomes given some required capitalization rate to make the purchase attractive relative to other income alternatives. Without getting into the underlying infinite series math behind it, the formula is value equals NOI over a cap rate. In this example, we assume a valuation cap rate of 5%, so you get a 5% yield on the purchase, essentially, uh, which gets us to a home price of $300,000. Now we assume that insurance premium expectations double from $2,500 a year to $5,000 a year, say as a result of the risk rating 2.0 initiative at the NFIP that's coming out next year. Even though the extra 2,500 a year is an additional cost of less than 1% of the current property value, because the extra payment is expected to persist in the next year and the year after that and forever, the impact on the property value at a constant cap rate of 5% is actually a 17% hit, again, for less than 1% increase um, in costs. If we assume further that this change in operating costs opens up additional concerns about future cost increases and other knock-on effects, the required cap rate for the next buyer might increase from 5% to 7.5%, leading to a 44% decline in the value of that property. Uh, so last slide, please. While this discussion is about climate risks, I wanted to close with a slide on the pandemic impacts on real estate markets. Um, I'm a big believer in the idea that it helps to know where we are before we're trying to figure out where we're going, and the pandemic is having a lot of impact on the current environment. Uh, vacancy rates are increasing across all property types because of both indirect um, challenges related to social distancing, uh, sorry, sorry, waning demand uh, due to the economic recession and direct challenges um, due to social distancing and the uh, impact that has on office and retail business models. Uh, CMBS loan defaults have spiked in retail and hotel se sectors, suggesting that landlords anticipate a prolonged period of weak demand uh, versus a quick return to business as usual. Uh, speaking of business as usual, that happens to be the phrase people use to describe uh, the RCP 8.5 scenario uh, in the CMIP 5 data I mentioned on the first slide. This is the scenario in which policy doesn't confront the problem head on and temperatures and hazard probabilities continue to increase unchecked. I actually calibrated the example on the previous slide to roughly present a medium home in one of the most exposed 20% of US homes in that particular scenario. So we're essentially talking about a 44% expected hit to home values in the riskiest quintile of the housing markets if these costs were to rationalize uh, to that business as usual scenario. Uh, 
Uh, the pandemic itself offers a stark illustration of a global risk event that scientists have been warning about for years and could actually serve as a catalyst for rationalization cost expectations. In addition to ongoing issues like a failing California insurance market and mounting flood risks costs that, that, that Evan, I think, will also talk about. This brings up another market relevant issue around tail risks. Um, I tend to focus my research on probable outcomes, like the nicely packaged RCP scenarios in the CMIP-5, uh, so that readers and listeners can get a sense of investment impacts without having to stretch their imaginations in outcomes that don't connect well with their intuitive sense of the world around them. When it comes to climate change, most scientists are actually really concerned about the tails. Um, scenarios that are outside of the currently understood range of likely outcomes. The COVID-19 pandemic tells us that we need to pay attention to these less probable outcomes. Um, on that pleasant note, I'll hand it back to John and the rest of the panel to tell us what these predictions could mean for Boston and how we can do our best to plan ahead and, and minimize the, the negative impacts. Thank you. Great, thanks, Dave. Um, and again, just a, a reminder, if you have questions uh, that you wanna ask of Dave's presentation, please put your questions in the chat box uh, so we can um, see them and, and, and queue them up for the panelists during the Q&A session. Um, the next speaker is uh, Tim Coffin, and Tim's gonna talk about how climate risk is affecting uh, municipal finance markets. So how some of the dynamics that Dave was laying out are affecting um, the folks who issue and purchase municipal uh, bonds. Tim? Good morning, thank you. Uh, so thanks, John, yes, and I am uh, indeed going to speak about the, the why, but also the how. Investors are pricing climate risk into the municipal bond market, and the important role the municipal market uh, will have itself in addressing the urgency of climate change. So to provide some context and to, for make, to frame my comments, Breckenridge Capital Advisors is a Boston-based fixed income manager. We manage bond portfolios. We're an independent employee-owned firm, and we're organized as a benefit corporation here in Massachusetts. We manage investment-grade bond portfolios for investors who count on our strategies to provide safe, reliable returns and income. Investors and their advisors use Breckenridge as a counterbalance to the risks they are taking elsewhere. Across all our strategies, we manage a little over 40 billion in assets and about 35 billion of that is in municipal bonds. So with our roots in the muni market and preservation of capital, our priority for an investment process, we are very aware of the reality that across all the capital markets, the municipal bond market will likely be the asset class that feels the first tremors of the risks associated with climate change. We know that local governments are on the front lines of climate risk, both from a problem standpoint and a solution standpoint. Investors can't ignore this and local governments, local governments municipalities can't ignore investors. So to explain the significance of the problem and the importance of the Green Ribbon Commission as part of the solution, I need to give you a very quick primer on the US muni bond market, and I'll keep it quick. Just for background, the US muni market dates back to the 1800s. There are roughly 40,000 different bond issuers with a total of about three and a half trillion in outstanding debt today. Now, importantly, municipalities and their related agencies and authorities, they issue debt primarily to build essential capital infrastructure, projects such as schools, bridges, public transportation, access to clean water. For the most part, municipalities do not borrow money to pay their bills. Indeed, a key foundation of the credit safety of municipal bonds is the essentiality of the public projects they finance. It's also important to stop and understand 
how capital intensive running a municipality is. New schools and wastewater facilities are enormous projects. Municipalities rely on access to the capital markets to raise the money they need to build these projects. The bond market in return allows borrowers to finance these projects over their useful life. And that helps share the cost of the financing with the people who will also be benefiting from the projects in the future. Taxpayers, ratepayers, people getting to work on public transit. Public infrastructure is an investment in long-term economic prosperity. With that said, it stands now that many cities and towns and utilities across the country are actually grappling with deferred maintenance backlogs of their infrastructure. Underinvestment in infrastructure and deferred maintenance of existing public projects becomes an economic drag, or for bond investors like Breckenridge, a credit negative. So that's your primer. Essential public projects are financed in the municipal bond market. Investors care about the essentiality of the project being financed as a measure of willingness to pay. And upkeep on public projects avoids an infrastructure deficit that can weigh on the economic well being of a community. Of course, as investors, credit work goes much deeper than that. Clearly, any investors who lend money to communities want to know the sound fundamentals. And by this, I mean, what is the tax base? How much cash does a community have? Or how much debt do they have? What kind of customer base or rate paying base does a water or electric utility have? But increasingly, rigorous investing has to look beyond just those fundamentals. It requires an eye on the medium to long term. ESG investors understand that taking a more holistic view of the creditworthiness of these communities may help avoid latent risks and actually improve risk adjusted returns. Longer term risks include including climate risk adaptation and the impact of transitioning to a low carbon economy can have relevance today and should be included in comprehensive credit analysis of any municipal bond issuer. Because even if these longer term risks for municipalities are on the long term, the markets can start to price that risk much sooner. And that can impact the value of the bond portfolios we manage. And it can also impact the cost of raising capital in the bond market for local governments. The possibility that climate risk will increase the borrowing cost for communities is only one of the reasons why our credit research team points out that climate risk may actually act as a threat multiplier or accelerator. And by that, I mean that current climate events can actually magnify the existing credit weakness of a bond issuer. In other words, further stressing already stressed communities. During one of last week's Climate Week panels, one speaker pointed out that heat stress will be a significant climate issue for municipalities. Heat stress is the sort of risk that places stress on utility grids, community services, and it disproportionately affects the more vulnerable populations. That includes the elderly, elderly and low income. It can also have a detrimental uh, effect, for example, on agriculture, and that creates additional stress in communities depend, that depend on that sector. So if you stop and compare these risks as they're faced by communities versus how they're faced by companies or even individual people, they're very different. There aren't a lot of businesses in Boston that if they had to, couldn't pick up and move. If, if, if areas in the city became inaccessible or impractical. The city of Boston doesn't have that option. This is the front line of climate change and climate risk. It's also why at Breckenridge, we have been investing so aggressively to integrate climate factors into our investment research for close to a decade. Remember my opening comments. Our clients count on our strategy to provide safe, reliable investment returns. We have clients in every state and invest in municipal bonds in every state. 
our research teams have been working hard to understand the materiality of climate risk to different regions and different sectors, different types of issuers. We've partnered with data providers, scoured reporting from government agencies and NGOs, and engaged with municipalities directly to improve our understanding of climate risk and make sure those risks are properly accounted for in our clients' portfolios. I do like to say that we were a first mover integrating ESG in fixed income, but we are most certainly no longer alone. More recently, there has actually been a fair amount of research published by the rating agencies and the investment banks, and it indicates municipal investors are more broadly accepting that the risks associated with climate, rate, climate change will likely occur more frequently and that their effects will be felt more widely. Investors are getting more persistent sourcing climate data and formal in how they measure the materiality of its impact on their investments. Asset owners, our clients, are also demanding reporting that shows how their investments are contributing both positively and negatively to climate risk. And as a side, at this point, it's worth pointing out, there's a tremendous amount of demand from those asset owners to invest in environmental finance, green bonds and such. So if investors are getting better at understanding climate change and finding more ways to price climate risk more effectively, what does that mean for municipalities and climate change more broadly? And I'd make two points. One, municipalities need to be responsive and transparent with investors on their sustainability plans. And they increasingly are. Number two, if you're looking to move the needle in climate change, you've come to the right webinar. It's going to happen in the muni market. Aside from the risks I've touched upon, I believe the solution, the infrastructure needed to build a, resi a resilient economy will be financed for the most part in the municipal bond market. I think Climate Ready Boston and the Boston Green Ribbon Commission's Climate Preparedness Working Group proves how this starts. If communities can identify and value what I'll refer to as a climate infrastructure deficit, what is it going to cost? Then the analysis can be done on the cost of closing that deficit gap versus the cost of doing nothing at all taxpayers and policymakers can make their own judgment just as they always have with schools and roads and transit and all the public projects that help communities flourish by investing in the future. This is how public finance works. And logically, it's why the municipal bond market itself is widely recognized as a safe asset class for investors. Investing in community resilience and shared opportunity simply isn't a speculative investment strategy. The only hard part is that we all have to be more willing to raise our sight lines on the horizon just a little bit, just as previous generations did for our benefit. Thank you, and I'll turn it back to the moderator. Thank you. Great, <clears throat> thanks, Tim. Uh, that was terrific, and thanks for the little tutorial on municipal finance for those of us who are not in that market. Uh, uh, next up, um, Evan is going to talk about um, the analytics that risks use and, and how those analytics can be used for a municipality like Boston or other municipalities to actually start to get more precise about where the return on investment is uh, for uh, resilience investments. And as many of you from the Boston area know, um, this is a really timely topic for the city of Boston. Um, uh, we're a couple of weeks away from issuing the last of the five uh, neighborhood um, uh, Climate Ready Boston reports that analyze um, what their specific neighborhood risks are and what the projects are that need to be invested in and what the cost of those projects is. So um, this is uh, moving pretty quickly from analytics to the need to actually figure out um, how we make these investments and how we justify these investments. And that's part of the analytics that uh, Evan is going to talk about. So Evan, take it away. All right. Awesome. Thanks, John. Uh, hey, everybody. Uh, my name is Evan Kodra. I'm a hybrid of a data scientist and a climate scientist. 
Um, really excited to be here. This is, you know, really close to the mission of risk. In fact, it aligns directly with it and just something I've been, you know, personally uh, thinking about for a long time now. Um, we can go ahead and go to the next slide, please. So RISC was founded officially in uh, 2016, it was something that I had been thinking about um, since roughly 2012 or so. Uh, it's, you know, it's a spin out of, of Northeastern University, uh, fully funded by the National Science Foundation. Uh, and our mission, broadly speaking, has always been to catalyze uh, climate action um, through some aspect of the financial sector. Uh, I had spent, you know, Dave gave a good uh, quick intro to um, to the idea of, of the CMIP-5 project I had spent, you know, I've been looking at global climate models since 2009 or so um, and, and doing statistical analysis on that. Around 2013-14, I started really thinking about um, doing something uh, outside of the academic context in particular because I started to get frustrated with how much good research and, and knowledge there really was already built up in, in academia and in literature that just wasn't being leveraged at all to do much practical and, and you know, adaptation in, in the real world. And obviously that's changing really fast right now and a whole lot in the last uh, few years. Um, so we actually started in 2016 uh, with that in mind and uh, moved at first into the insurance sector. So if we can go to the next slide, please. So I'll touch on catastrophe modeling again that uh, Dave brought up before. Um, when we first began RISC, I was uh, you know, aware of the catastrophe modeling sector as the, the sort of the main market where uh, folks were working on things like hurricane models, flood models, wildfire models, all to support the pricing uh, and solvency decisions in that space, uh, primarily for reinsurers and also for things like catastrophe bonds. Um, so our initial thesis there was, uh, you know, as Dave pointed out, none of the, the, uh, the, the participants in that market were actually uh, doing anything serious uh, in terms of forward looking climate change projections. Uh, and that's actually still the case today. Um, historic, you know, the, the complete reliance on historical data um, has a lot of you know, reasons that are understandable. Um, but also, but is it in fact, you know, really linked to uh, the structural sort of setup of that market. So what we realized after, you know, getting sort of technical buy-in from folks in that industry, but no commercial traction was that uh, those structural incentives just didn't uh, really allow for uh, folks to look forward in time because so much of the, the, the dynamics were around um, repricing on an annual basis in terms of premiums, um, where people have an exit valve or an entry valve uh, to, to manage their exposure to risk without needing to look that uh, far into the future. Um, so we took a step back in around 2017 and started thinking about this, uh, this idea of the insurance gap, which you can see on the left. This is a pretty famous graph uh, put out by Swiss Re, which is at a global aggregate scale. Um, and without getting too far into the weeds of it, the basic point of this is that by now, the majority of catastrophe and of course climate losses are actually absorbed, um, are unabsorbed by insurance. Well, we started thinking about well, where does that risk actually manifest? Um, and as Tim pointed out, one of the first, you know, we realized pretty quickly after, after taking a step out of the weeds with the insurance sector is that that risk would start to manifest uh, in the municipal finance market. Um, so we, you know, just to give you a, a example of how, of how serious this is in particular in the U.S., our analysis so far has, has said that, or has shown that about 80 to 90 percent of residential flood risk is currently uninsured. So that's adding immense pressure to all, you know, ends of the public finance spectrum and eventually that's going to manifest uh, in some form in the real estate uh, market as well. Um, and add climate change on top of that, which is obviously exacerbating this already unsustainable pressure point. We need to do something about it. So uh, we can move to the next slide, please. What we decided to do was to launch a product for uh, starting with a municipal market, um, in particular because we, we believe that, uh, you know, as Tim uh, said very uh, clearly, um, that's the, the market where we believe we can help incentivize and elucidate um, some of the means to actually adapting to climate change. 
um, through the tools of municipal finance. Um, we essentially built a platform that is, um, is catastrophe modeling. So we didn't reinvent any wheels that we didn't have to. Um, and I'll explain a little bit more in detail what that looks like. And we added two new pieces, uh, two new key pieces to that catastrophe modeling um, framework to uh, make that framework relevant to uh, municipal, the municipal market as well as real estate. So at a at atomical level, um, basically there are three components to, the, to, the, to a catastrophe model. Um, and I'll reference these a few more times. Um, so there's exposure. Um, so the assets that are actually exposed to a climate hazard. Um, there's the hazard itself characterized by, uh, you know, the hazard's probability and intensity. And the key thing to understand there is that the intensity and or the probability can actually be modulated by climate change for those hazards. And then there's the connective tissue between the two, which is vulnerability or so-called damage functions. And essentially, if you have some, you know, construction characteristics or physical characteristics about your exposure, um, you know, for a building that's easy to understand in terms of the, the height of that building, whether it has a basement, the, you know, the construction materials used in it, um, as well as the, the, the components of the, the physical components of the hazard. So for example, with flood, you have depth of water, probability of observing that depth of water given a flood. You can combine all those through these damage functions to estimate the financial damage done to those assets. Um, and if you, you can imagine doing that at scale, and that's essentially what we do for the municipal market. Let me integrate two different components in this um, that are not found in a, uh, a more traditional catastrophe model. Uh, the first is uh, so-called what we call climate conditioning. So this is explicit forward-looking climate change modeling to hazards under you know, well-accepted scena uh, well scenarios like RCP 8.5 and 4.5 that Dave was talking about earlier. Um, and all of those are, you know, we're looking forward at investment relevant time scales. And one of the things that's really important to understand, you know, about both real estate and municipal finance is that they do operate on those sort of 10 to 30 year time scales, unlike insurance. And then the second uh, piece is a more generalized um, look at exposure. So in the insurance market, uh, exposure is essentially, um, with exceptions, but essentially a uh, a portfolio of insured buildings or assets. Right here, we are more interested in looking at the total local economy for the purposes of municipal finance, or the total uh, portfolio within a secure, uh, you know, within a real estate security, where there's some opacity in terms of what uh, what properties are actually part of that portfolio. So, uh, moving on to the to the next slide, please. First, starting with just a quick look at uh, what that uh, architect, that uh, exposure economic architecture looks like. Um, we essentially take a whole bunch of GIS layers, and I could go on, you know, I could do a whole hour about just this piece. We take a whole bunch of different uh, disparate uh, GIS layers that come in different formats, at different resolutions, at different um, levels of, of, of accuracy and precision. Um, and we blend these all together through a, a, general, uh, a general machine learning uh, process called dazimetric modeling, which essentially lets us infer correlations and connections between all these layers um, to then map or downscale um, arbitrary values and metrics to a, what we use, which is our canonical 100 by 100 meter grid that covers the entire US. Um, so rather than just having point location uh, properties that we look at, uh, we can estimate value, uh, things like GDP output, things like property value by class, um, and social metrics all down at that 100 meter grid. Uh, the, one of the, the value uh, propositions for, for our municipal product there is then you can look at any um, obligor, any debt obligor issuer um, with any arbitrary spatial structure to it. So a hospital a service catchment or a county or a city or a utility. Um, we can look at all of those and then connect those uh, the metrics that we can put out directly to, to bonds that are out there in, in an active in the ecosystem. And a similar idea um, follows for uh, different uh, securitized real estate, for example. So that's, the, that's, one, that's one component and that's you know, a, a unique way of looking at exposure. Uh, moving on to the next slide. Um, this is uh, the climate conditioning that's been brought up a few times. So this is an example of what that looks like for, um, and this is brand new stuff. So this is the first time we're, we're showing any of this. Um, on the top, we're looking at 
wildfire. It might be a little bit hard to see, but what you're looking at on the top left is uh, a base sort of current uh, wildfire risk across the entire U.S. We work with the, we work closely with the U.S. Forest Service on this. Um, they have really good physical models, um, but only based on historical data until now. Um, so this is the sort of base current risk. And then on the right, um, everything that you see glowing in red under RCP 8.5 by 2040 is getting more intense in terms of burn probability. But what's that? That, of course, is going to have huge implications. We already know what's, we can already see what's going on in the West right now. Um, which is already you know, really scary by the year 2040 under, uh, under this um, you know, business as usual or worst case scenario and some people uh, refer to it as we're going to see um, we're going to see that get quite a bit worse. So more uh, specific maybe to the Boston area on the bottom we have uh, our just our brand new uh, look at um, climate conditioned inland flood. So even looking at 2020 relative to historical flood, which is what most of the, the catastrophe modeling vendors out there look at, we're already seeing that return periods or recurrence intervals of things like 100 year floods are already 90 year floods or 80 year floods, depending on where you look in most locations in the US. So the risk has already gotten worse. If you think of Boston in particular, by the time we get to about 2040, we're going to be looking at what used to be an inland flood of you know, one in 100 year event is going to be around a one in 70 year event if you're looking at RCP 8.5. So that's in addition to um, sea level rise and coastal flood, which I think are more of the focus of, of discourse when you think about Boston area um, discussion around climate change. So if you start thinking about how all these risks stack on each other, um, and, and Dave made this point much more clearly than I could, um, we're going to need to make some kind of massive intervention to get ahead of this uh, before the market sort of rationalizes or overreacts on its own. And it's really important that we, we get ahead of this for, for the entire health of the municipal market as well as, as well as the real estate market and then all the second order effects that would follow from there. Um, go to the next slide, please. So as a, as a starting point for us, um, the, the way to get the ball rolling has been to um, you know, help, help folks in both of these spaces get their, uh, get a handle on um, what's, you know, what this looks like. So the, the first main tier of, of customers that we have are municipal bond asset managers primarily. Um, and so this is a screenshot of our user interface. We're just, as an example, looking uh, at a relatively high risk place in the Boston area, uh, Winthrop, if you're familiar with that, uh, with that jurisdiction. Um, where you can, you know, in, the, in that user interface, you can drill down to climate, uh, to get a climate risk summary and a benchmarking uh, view of that. Um, and then on the right, this is something that's also important to think about in the ESG context for a bunch of reasons. Uh, we actually provide a whole bunch of uh, demographics and socioeconomics, workforce characteristics, health data, et cetera, uh, at that same 100 meter grid that we can aggregate into insights um, that are important for at least two reasons, right? The first is that as far as climate risk, the S and if you're thinking of ESG, the S can't really be separated from the E. Um, we all know that climate change is a physical risk, but it's also a social environmental justice issue, right? And, we, and there's a broad understanding um, and a lot of data showing that vulnerable and marginalized populations are already being impacted earlier and more severely than, uh, than more affluent folks. So, and then the other component is just that ESG is growing in popularity as an investment class for a lot of good reasons. Um, and so putting all these things in, in one place uh, supports a rigorous quantitative look at ESG. So given all this, um, I wanted to then go to the, to the last slide um, that I have, which actually puts all this together in a way that is a proposed framework for thinking about actually acting on and, and uh, acting on working on this this idea that Tim said uh, nicely, which is uh, the climate infrastructure deficits. How do we actually think about this? So we're actually doing some work uh, right now. We just had a kickoff meeting yesterday, actually, uh, with the, the water re uh, engineering uh, company Hazen and Sawyer um, for the Boston Water and Sewer Commission, uh, which is looking at uh, flood risk, coastal flood risk in particular, um, given scenarios at 2030 and out to 2070, mostly focused on, uh, on coastal flood, 
um, using the you know, best in class sort of sea level rise projections. Uh, what we're doing with that that project and what we'll be you know what we're proposing in general um, is to is to add the benefits to the the one of the major barriers to climate to practical climate adaptation that keeps coming up over and over again has been how do you think about the benefits of a resilience uh, project right so it's easy to to propose a flood wall um, or storm drainage upgrades that can easily run into the billions of dollars in terms of the costs but how do you justify those costs? Well, the natural uh, way to think about this could be, let's look at the benefits. So if we have you know, economic, economic uh, centric projections around how climate risk will impact things that are relevant to um, viability of uh, things like property impairment or property value risk, GDP impairment, those things that make uh, municipal finance viable um, and actually are the basis of generating taxes, we need to look at how much avoided loss from, the, from those types of standpoints we would, we would, seek, we would see over time frames that are relevant to that capital investment. So these are all completely made up numbers for the sake of illustrating the point. Um, but what we're looking at is a matrix of, so if you look at the no action columns, what we're, what we're saying is, okay, if we were to look out to, you know, until that year 2070 or whatever the relevant time frame is, What's the property value loss that we would expect to experience over that time frame, uh, maybe on an annualized average basis? What's the what's the same thing in terms of GDP output? So how much GDP would otherwise be realized um, in absence of all climate risk? And then, you know, arbitrarily look at, you know, for the just conceptually here, look at a couple of different project proposals. So like project A and B, obviously in, in real world, these would be these would have a ton of detail attached to them. And then model, do that, run those same models, but under, uh, under the assumption of, or under the, the modeling of, of which locations would actually be protected um, given those, uh, resilient, you know, given a resilience measure. Um, and then essentially you can roll all this type of thinking back using relatively standard uh, financial tools like payback period metrics, net present value analysis, um, all looking at, you know, while looking at the, you know, putting this in back in real dollars um, and turn this into a, a, a pretty classic cost benefit analysis where it becomes clear whether project A, B, or C, D, et cetera, uh, make the most sense from an economic standpoint on ROI. And you can do all this with uncertainty, quantification, et cetera, too. Um, and then from an ESG context, again, just coming back to the last slide, it's really important not to just focus on the economic piece alone, right? Um, so if we, if we want to make this a viable economic, uh, viable um, ESG uh, idea, we also need to be looking at um, not only the financial district where you're going to see the, the potentially the you know, majority of economic benefits, but we also need to understand um, the, the population impacts of whatever those projects are. So evaluating the, you know, for example, shown here, population below the per, uh, poverty line as a percentage impacted by um, by climate events in a no action versus adaptation scenarios. And you can imagine extending that to a whole bunch of different social metrics. So uh, I will leave it at that. I, uh, I, I just wanted to put that uh, framework out there as sort of a where the rubber hits the road. Um, and, and thanks uh, Tim and Dave for, for teeing me up so well on this. Great. Uh, thanks, Evan. I'm sure we'll have lots of questions as to, to, to dig into the, your uh, your uh, deep uh, technical process. But it's great to, it's great to see the analytics catching up with the political reality of um, us needing to start thinking about how we actually make these uh, investments. Um, and next up, uh, we're going to hear from Drew, who's on the inside of the city, um, looking out, interacting. Um, uh, with the Moody's and Standards and Poor's um, uh, and, uh, and, and other folks like Rick and Rick. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, how this is showing up in uh, the bond process within the municipality. Drew? Yeah, thanks very much. Uh, I want to thank Tim for doing some of my job for me uh, and giving you all a bond 101. So that is going to save me a lot of time now that you're all Muni experts and you know exactly where I'm coming from. Uh, I'm treasurer with City of Boston, uh, or head of treasury for the City of Boston. I'm responsible uh, here for $1.8 billion in um, operating cash 
as far as management of that and the safekeeping of that and the investing of that, uh, as well as a number of other things, receiving the money and also um, expending the money uh, at the direction of budget. However, we're also responsible for the annual debt issuance, which is approximately $150 million a year. Our annual debt issuance is really what funds uh, the majority of the capital budget. And the majority of the, cap or the capital budget is really um, where you're gonna find all these infrastructure projects that we're about to talk about um, that, that we're putting in place to mitigate the impacts of climate change. So let me go two slides in. Uh, so, you know, if you couldn't tell, I'm not originally from Boston. One of the, one of the best things about moving to Boston 11 years ago is, you know, getting to understand the history. Uh, we obviously have a historical context for this particular exposure. Uh, it's worth noting, um, probably doesn't even require saying, that the very thing that created Boston to be this economic engine, which is our coastal exposure, is also the thing that also prevents the most vulnerability right now to the impacts of climate change. As our footprint expanded, it's expanded by 50% over the last, three, uh, over the last uh, 300 years, as, as that has happened, part of the way we expanded that footprint was by filling most of our riverbanks and coastal shoreline uh, with land that was just at high tide. So um, accommodating that population growth, accommodating that commerce growth has also um, exposed us to, as I'd mentioned, the risk of climate change. So it's something that we've been thinking about for a while. This is not new to us. Uh, you know, the city of Boston was an early mover in this space in 2000, we launched uh, our climate action program, enjoying the cities for climate protection campaign. Uh, the the addition in 2011, we went a step further. In 2007, we uh, put out our climate action plan. We updated that in 2011 and 2014. In 2011, uh, we signed on to a commitment to reduce our carbon emissions by 80 percent by the year 2050. Uh, and in 2014, we built on the climate plan that was already in place with Climate Ready Boston, which I'll speak to you uh, about very, very quickly, because I'm not a project guy, I'm the finance guy. And normally when I'm talking to these rating agencies and investors like Tim Coffin, uh, I make sure I have, you know, Chris Cook with me, who's the chief of environment and open space, or Justin Starrett with me, who's the city's budget director, and they can really assist in some of the details there. But I will say that with Climate Ready Boston, what we did was essentially it was a four-pronged approach. We updated uh, the city's climate projections, so we understood uh, we had the most up-to-date information that we could so we could form our plans. We applied that information to vulnerability assessments across eight geographic focus areas in the city. These were essentially case studies to make sure we really understood um, what the projections were, what the vulnerability was and where the vulner vulnerability was in uh, each section of the city. And then we used all that information to synthesize uh, climate resilience initiatives. And those are operational initiatives, they are financial initiatives, uh, just really anything that we uh, thought we could loop into the plan. So let's go two more slides in. And this really talks about uh, what we're doing. So we understood that this is gonna cost the city a lot of money. Uh, we also understood uh, that, as you mentioned earlier, there's a cost-benefit analysis here, and that if we can go ahead and spend dollars now and spend them wisely, we can save a lot of money over the long term. Uh, but also, we can do the right thing by residents. So um, there, we generally try to en envision all of these projects and through five different lenses. So we wanted to create multiple benefits wherever we could. A good example of this is when we build flood barriers to the extent that that can provide additional open recreational space, that's a benefit. Um, to the extent that for non-physical interventions that we can uh, help businesses develop operational plans that limit their flood risk, uh, that may also decrease their utility costs, which is gonna be better for the bottom line of the business or help them decrease their flood insurance premiums. We wanted to incorporate local involvement in everything we're doing. So, we do this for a couple of different reasons. The most obvious is, is that if you can encourage um, community involvement in the plans you're developing, then you can encourage better adoption of those plans because it's really gonna be a group effort. It's gonna take all of us. But also when we're on the ground and we're speaking with community leaders and we're speaking with residents, invar invariably we come to understand new challenges and new problems that maybe we weren't even aware of. So we learn a lot more about the process and kind of how we can make things better when we do that. 
This is actually the really cool one. So creating multiple independent layers of protection. A really good example of this is, uh, well, first of all, what we're trying to do is uh, create redundancies and enhance our efforts. A good example is incorporating tree canopy with um, cool roofing materials. So what you're essentially doing with the tree canopy is reducing the cooling load um, on the roof and then the roof, because the materials you're using is radiating less heat back into the canopy. So that's one example of the types of considerations that we're taking when we're putting these projects online. Let's go to the next page. Um, the, for the last two, um, we wanna design in flexibility and adaptability whenever we can. We understand that the rain that's coming down now is not gonna be the same as the rain that comes down in 40 years. And so when we're putting stormwater projects in place, we want to make sure that it can handle uh, the difficulties that we're dealing with today, but we also want to make sure that it can handle what's going to be happening in 40 years. When we're building uh, buildings, uh, a decent example of this is making sure that in some cases the first floor has an extra high ceiling because we understand with sea level rise, there may be a need in the future, depending on where the building's located, to fill that first floor in so you can still have a completely functional workable building. Uh, the last that I'll mention is leveraging building cycles. So it is not cost effective. It creates a lot of disruption if you were to go in and uh, tear up a road to put in green infrastructure uh, outside of the building cycle. So what we're really, as an example, so what we're really looking at doing is incorporating green infrastructure as we rebuild roads, as we rebuild buildings, and as we rebuild infrastructure. And again, that's just going to um, decrease the, the disruption on the population. So for the final section, let's go two more slides in, and this will be the last. Um, I talked to you a bit about the types of considerations that we had at the outset, because that is exactly the type of information that we have to give the rating agencies. It's exactly the type of information we have to give investors, uh, so Tim's group. And believe it or not, rating agencies and investors um, have fairly different objectives. Uh, the, the last one I'll talk about, I'll speak about first, is economic partners. These are essentially, um, this is one of the groups we're communicating with, it's essentially our businesses. So making sure that businesses that are already located here know that this is going to be a viable long-term option geographically. Uh, businesses that potentially want to locate to Boston, so they understand that we have this issue, we're dealing with it, uh, and Boston remains a great option over the long term. And then also businesses that require local customer base, just make sure that they understand that uh, we're gonna make sure that that customer base is here and that residents stay in Boston because we're managing the situation. So let me go back to the Raiders. Uh, the Raiders primary objective is to determine long-term credit worthiness of the borrower. They don't care generally about the marketability of your bonds. Um, they're not as interested in the color of your bonds, whether they're green or not. They're trying to make sure that you're going to be able to repay your debt service uh, over the term uh, of that bond issuance. And if that's 20 years, great. If it's 30 years, they're looking at that too. Um, the thing about the rating agencies is that they are not hermetically sealed. So they're seeing the same data that we are. And they're not cl uh, climate scientists, and they'll tell you that. But they are seeing that the Wildfires on the West Coast are becoming more frequent and the temperatures in the middle of the country are becoming more extreme and the storms, you know, on our southern coast and eastern coast are becoming more intense. And they rely to a large extent on us as, as issuers to take all of the data that we've been collecting from folks like Evan and to synthesize that into plans and present it to them. Because what we're essentially trying to do when we meet, the, meet with the rating agencies is make sure that they understand that we have a handle on the issue, uh, that we have the financial wherewithal to afford the planning on a going forward basis. Um, they are looking right now quite significantly at the cooperation levels between, you know, the city of Boston can't do it itself. It's gonna require cooperation between the city, the state and the federal government. And all of these resources are gonna have to be brought to bear to make sure that we can um, kind of meet the challenges that are facing us. So that's a big part of the conversation also. You know, I've spoken with the Raiders uh, a number of times about this. I've been a debt issuer for about 11 years now. And I can tell you that 
They've always been interested. There have always been internal conversations with the rating agencies about climate change impact mitigation. But I would say over the last five years, it has really, really hit kind of hyper speed. And it used to be that pension obligations were the beginnings and ends of all the rating agency discussions. And that's still true to some extent, but climate change is a huge, huge part of what we actually talk about now. I think part of that's probably for Boston because of our proximity to the water. And it's something that, that they understand that we're gonna rely on over the long term. Uh, but what they're essentially looking at is just to make sure that uh, the plans we have in place, the debt we're issuing is something that is uh, really still affordable from a budgetary perspective because we're spending money today. You know, We're not just gonna be spending money in the next 20 years, we're actually spending it today to put a lot of these plans in place that you're gonna see in Climate Ready Boston. Uh, and that has some impact to the budget. So making sure that they have a comfort level uh, is gonna be beneficial to us. The last point I'll make is on the investor side. I think Tim did a great job, so I don't really have to talk quite as much about that. But investors are interested certainly in their own internal credit analyses, and they're doing the same analysis, and we're providing them a lot of the same information that we provide to the rating agencies. They're also interested in some other things, so marketability of the bonds making sure that it's the right maturity, making sure it's the right coupon, but also to some extent, uh, there is increasing, as Tim had mentioned, increasing demand for green bonds out there. Um, I worked on the Commonwealth's 2013 issuance of green bonds, and that was the first issuance in the country of green bonds. I mean, in fact, we've been issuing green bonds for years, we just don't call them that. Um, but the Commonwealth did in 2013, and uh, when the rest of the deal was having some real difficulty, that green series of bonds it was a food fight uh, and they were flying off the shelf because that's really what investors wanted. And I think that you're seeing more and more of that. So I'm just gonna turn it back over to, to John uh, and happy to answer any questions you have. Um, great, thanks Drew. Uh, really appreciate your bringing the uh, city perspective in. Um, uh, Claire, could you just do the last slide and then we don't have to do the slideshow anymore. We can take it off and have a Q and A with the panelists. Um, and um, the, the last slide is just highlighting um, our next program, uh, which is on a, a, a really different kind of topic. It's October 14th it's with Joan Fitzgerald, um, Leah Bamberger, who used to be with the city of Boston, um, and several other great panelists on participatory climate justice planning. This is sort of how you do climate planning in ways that put uh, social equity and vulnerable populations sort of at the center of the planning. All of you who, um, registered uh, for this event, we'll get an invite for that event um, in a relatively short period of time. So you can uh, take the slides out now, Claire, thanks. Um, uh, I have uh, two or three questions I wanna ask the panelists and then we'll go to the uh, questions from the, um, from the audience. And this is sort of, I think generally to, you know, Dave, Tim, Evan, um, uh, what's your perception of how Boston compares to other municipalities in terms of the way it has recognized and is concretely addressing a climate risk in a way that has credibility um, with raters? And are there other municipalities in the U.S. that are doing better than we are that we could learn from? So could you just put the, your, your sense of Boston in a little bit of a national context? That would be useful to kick this off. Uh, so it is difficult to say how the Raiders view other municipalities. I can tell you that they, uh, I get the impression that, and they can certainly speak for themselves, but I get the impression that uh, they understand that we are taking this very seriously. One of the questions I asked uh, before I had my first rating agency meeting here at the city um, uh, was with our chief of environment and open space at the time. I said, okay, your plans sound great and, and this looks really good, but I'm not a cl climate scientist either. So give me some context as far as how is the city of Boston doing in relation to our peers? And this was not a biased answer. He said, we're generally viewed as one of the top kind of um, planners in this space. So Boston has been paying attention to this for a long time and I think it shows uh, more generally, but I, I do think uh, the rating agencies have a fair amount of comfort that not only are we addressing the issue, but we can afford to address it. 
Kim, what's your experience? Yeah, I mean, well, I would pick up on Drew's clo closing statement that they can afford to address it. I mean, I you know, I have to kind of go back to my primer in that the muni market is a very fragmented market, right? There's 40,000 different issuers out there. They're issuing bonds. Uh, they can be water authorities. They can be school districts. They can be cities. Um, and so, you know, Boston is... Uh, in a position as a relatively affluent community to have the resources to invest in this. The thing that I think is, uh, and there are other cities, you know, I would highlight Pittsburgh as a city that's doing a really extraordinary job. Um, one of the things I would mention is that, you know, for investors and cities and everybody, we're all on this journey together. And the amount of data and interpretive guidance that that exists today that's coming from organizations like Evans um, is, is much different. Adam Stern, the head of our Muni research team called it a, 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 a data arms race, is much different than it was 10 years ago. And the significance of that is that we still are building this. And so we are very much still relying on transparency and disclosure and communities demonstrating that they are paying attention. I think that's going to evolve into kind of the more hard facts of what are the real risks and, and what are the real costs that municipalities are facing as we get a better, uh, as we are better prepared to model the actual climate risks. So that actually um, cues to a one audience question on transparency and, and that is, to what extent is the issue of climate risk getting integrated into the government accounting standards board? Um, materials. Is, has that happened yet or is that is that a ways to come? Uh, I can, uh, Drew's probably the most qualified to answer that, but the short answer is it's not. Um, you know, issuers are, uh, so GASB is the is municipalities uh, equivalent of FASB and uh, and they have standards of what, how government accounting is done. Um, they're municipalities are in, the disclosure of information from municipalities, material information to uh, municipalities is really enforced through the underwriters because that's where the SEC has control is to make sure that the underwriting firms, the investment banks are the ones that are making sure the material is disclosed. But realistically that, you know, what's going to happen here and in, in, is in, in the offering documents of, of these issuers, it's going to be increasingly there's pressure on these borrowers to make sure that they are transparent in all of the material risks that investors should be aware of. I'll, I'll echo that. The, uh, one of the most difficult parts of a bond sale is to go in and update your information statement, which is essentially, um, uh, for the city of Boston, it's a 45 page document that tells you everything you could possibly want to know about any material risk to the city, the financial position of the city. And to the extent that, there is a material risk that we are not accounting for in that information statement, uh, we're in trouble. And so we have to make sure that we put, we do a brain dump and, and tell the market everything we know. We then obviously, uh, Tim's exactly right, that information is really, it's the investment banks that are regulated to make sure that, you know, before they reoffer those bonds that uh, all that information is in place. But that is really where our disclosure around the climate change side of things comes into place is in the information statement. Um, a a, a follow-up question, Drew, that's related to that, and, and that is whether or not um, the climate risks actually end up getting differentiated by the underlying um, security for the bond. That is, you know, is it priced differently for bonds that have, you know, municipal general obligations, revenue bonds, industrial development bonds, et cetera. Is, does it get down to that level of differentiation from a, a, a risk assessment point of view? Well, it may. I mean, not for the city of Austin, because the city of Austin, I mean, we issue geo debt. So we don't have, um, you know, a lot of special indentures that, you know, are kind of separate revenue credits. Uh, the Commonwealth is a good example of one that has, you know, their geo credit, then they also have special revenue credits. It's really gonna depend on the ways that climate change impact the revenue that's backing up that particular credit. Uh, it depends on what the credit is responsible for. You know, the city of Boston is responsible for a lot generally. And so most everything is gonna impact the geo rating. Uh, if we had um, a special revenue source, 
uh, that was a carve out from the property tax base for a particular purpose, maybe it's not affected quite as badly. But the fact is, is that a lot of that is discounted by the fact that wherever the credit resides, um, wherever the revenue is derived, to the extent that you're in the same geographic region, which is really what you're talking about with climate change is geography, all of the risks we're talking about will some, in some way or another probably work their way into the credit. But the magnitude to kind of how it touches one credit versus another is going to be a little different. So, uh, Tim, the next audience question was for you. Uh, and the question is, what do you think needs to happen for municipal investors to price in climate associated risk when it comes to higher bond yields? Does it have to be a natural disaster related default downgrades? Or is it going to be more of a gradual transition? So to, in, in a way, kind of where's the tipping point on this? Well, I think uh, there, there will be a tipping point as, is our belief. And I think that'll probably be a little bit sector weighted. I think the, the answer to it, to the question is, you know, is risk being properly, and this would be a good, I would, I would actually forward this question on to Dave, is risk properly being accounted for in the first place, right? Risk is being largely engineered right now. And so the, it's easy for the markets to be complacent. So the short answer is um, when spreads widen, the spread between single A and triple A and you know, short yields and long yields and all of those things, when they widen, I believe that these risks will start to manifest themselves um, in the market and in pricing. But a tipping point can happen before that. Uh, and the tipping point could be anything from the rating agencies getting more aggressive in their downgrading. I think Drew's points there is it could be a disaster. It could be FEMA changing the rules. I mean, there's all kinds of things you can speculate about, about how the tipping point would be. But I think the, you know, right now risk is, you know, the markets are somewhat complacent from risk. And I, I think that if you don't mind me passing that to Dave to ask him about that, if that's the case in real estate as well, because it's relevant. Well, I'll, t I'll take it and then I'm going to pass it back to Evan with, <laughs> with another specific question. Um, you know, I, th I think what's, what's really relevant there, first of all, I'll, I'll say that markets generally are not accommodating these risk projections as expected costs into their cash flow analysis of securities. So that's, that's something that we don't, we have not yet seen um in things like uh mortgage-backed securities markets or REITs or, or anything like that um or or just private capital markets and direct real estate equity and lending you have started to see some um tiering you know some some risk-based pricing um more on the commercial side than than the residential side uh around hazard protection um but it, it's pretty nascent um, and what I would say, you know, regarding specifically the, the Muni question is even we, we've talked a lot about how all, you know, Evan can size these rest losses that are afforded in that type of analysis only speak to these point in time expected physical hazard losses. So like if, if, if the market were to, and I think it will, um, just because this is the economic fatigue that is facing the system, is that there just isn't enough money being collected to cover the costs of climate hazards right now. Um, so that's the big uninsured gap that Evan showed. You know, if that actually made its way into um, expectations of property buyers over a long forecast, the impact on property values could be dramatic. Um, and I'm actually not sure, but personally, and the reason, the, the, there's two reasons I want to hand this off to Evan. Um, one is I'm not sure how important property tax revenue base is to a, 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 a general uh, muni bond. Um, and, and then for the credit, and Tim, you might be able to answer that too. I'm sure you would. Um, and the other is, I know, Evan, you told me about some muni defaults in California. Um, sure. And you know, that's, that's the other thing that could obviously bring some more focus onto these risks 
by capital markets is, is actual defaults. Yep. Yeah. So when we, thanks Dave. So when we, we first uh, started doing sort of the, the diligence around the discovery process of uh, figuring out how we could do something in the muni bond market, um, it, there was some skepticism uh, early that climate was actually a, uh, a material enough risk um, in terms of defaults and delinquencies and those kinds of things. And that, that changed pretty dramatically um, after campfire uh, in paradise. Uh, and people realize that there, you can have these really acute um, defaults um, or you know, just entire cities disappearing. And obviously we, we're seeing that right now, continuing on in California like we've never seen before. Um, that being said, uh, generally speaking, so that the other component of your question is how important are property values to GO bonds or general obligation bonds, right? They're, they're essentially everything. So we have this inextricable link between um, the viability of, of GO bonds and the health of a local real estate market. So with those, those two, two risks are, are in, the, in the aggregate incredibly correlated, which is also a huge risk. Um, and hence, you know, the comment earlier about we all need to get ahead of this for the sustainability of these two markets, right? Um, in terms of whether we're seeing, you know, we, we did some, we've done some analysis um, on the aggregate. We haven't seen, uh, there's a bunch of reasons for this, including market dynamics, but also just sort of how new climate risk is for, for folks in terms of looking at uh, this from a data perspective. We haven't seen any aggregate pricing of, of climate into spreads yet. Um, but the first step there, again, is just empowering the market to, to decide how to do that, right? What we do is we, we tell you what the physical risk is in financial terms. Um, and then it's up to the, to the market to figure out how to, to, to a large extent, to figure out how to handle that, which is then going to ultimately create this uh, sort of incentive we're hoping will create an incentivization path for really systematic thinking about how to deal with how to actually deal with that from the issuer side of the point. So can I interpret that, Evan, as it's coming soon to a municipality near you? <laughs> uh, it feels like it, it's gearing up. Uh, and, and, and Dave, I guess this is a question back to you and then a bump to, a bump to Drew as to whether or not you've seen this happen um, in Boston. Um, what's the actual mechanism that would translate climate risk into cash flow valuations and asset, you know, property values, which would then affect revenue that the city gets for its operations. Uh, so, you know, is it, does it have to be insurance rates going up? Uh, is it the way, you know, appraisals on property are done and due diligence are done? What's the actual market mechanism that would make that happen? And then to you, Drew, um, has the city seen any evidence that sort of uh, attention to climate risk is affecting property values. I mean, uh, the gross sort of feedback we get is no, when you still see parcels down in the seaport selling for hundreds of millions of dollars, it does not seem to be translating into it yet. So, so Dave, could you just talk a little bit about the mechanism and then Drew, and if there's any sort of evidence of this happening yet in Boston? Yeah, absolutely. Well, so, so the mispricing that if things were rational would actually have property values down a bunch um is is what we're talking about so so why are buyers not factoring these easy to anticipate additional costs into their current expectations for cash flows so that's really the question and and and, and what what could change that um i would say there's there's two part it's a two part answer um, one is essentially the, the idea that, um, that their entire risk is being accommodated by their insurance policy. Um, and there's a big, you know, and actually private insurers, um, other than everyone getting wildfire wrong, don't even insure flood typically, right? So, that, that gets pushed to the National Flood Insurance Program, the NFIP, which oversubsidizes for political reasons um, and refrains from updating hazard definition maps, for, also for political reasons, um, which actually puts into the mind of property buyers 
that their expected costs are quite low into the future. And that's basically currently. So there's, there's a different, there's a, there's a mispricing of the actual current risk relative to what borrowers are expecting to pay. And that's probably because of all these subsidies. Um, you know, there's also comp complex dynamics just in state regulate, regulations around increasing uh, residential insurance premiums, less of an issue on the commercial side, et cetera. There's a lot of reasons why um, borrowers have it in their head, or not borrowers necessarily, but property buyers have it in their heads that the costs associated with these future events is, is lower than it actually should be. Um, things, catalysts that, that could change that. I mean, you know, the two sort of points of fatigue that are pretty relevant right now are, are obviously the, the California insurance market. So, you know, people have been enjoying low rates relative to their fire risk for a number of years. Um, that's changing, right? So insurers started pulling, um, not renewing people's fire policies last year. Um, well, that, that's been happening since 2017 in droves. In 2019, the state said, we're going to give a one-year moratorium on that. Um, that's coming to an end in December. So nobody knows in January if they're going to be able to actually renew their insurance policy. And it might go from $1,000 to $5,000. So whether it's the actual change of insurance going from $1,000 to $5,000 or everyone just knowing that it's going to happen, that's going to change expectations. Uh, the other big one, you know, like I said, a lot of this risk is in flood and a lot of it is uninsured. Um, and there's a lot of things contributing to that, mostly incentive systems, again, within uh, government policy, um, specifically around the NFIP. Um, you know, resources for disaster management are fatigued right now because of the pandemic. Um, so there is a big initiative at the NFIP uh, called Risk Rating 2.0. Um, that is supposed to reprice the entire flood insurance market next year on October 1st. Um, historically, a lot of those things get pushed and pushed and pushed. They're never politically popular to raise people's insurance premiums. Um, I think that this time it has a chance of really resetting the way flood risk is priced. And again, that's next year. That's, that's a catalyst. Um, and I think the other, just the third potential catalyst for correcting that um, that in, inappropriate expectation for costs um, is really just a lack of awareness of these expected hazards, just relying on insurance to tell you what that is. Um, and there's a lot of new tools coming out. There's something called, um, um, uh, it's, it's some, the First Street Foundation is a nonprofit that just rolled out an application um, where anyone can enter their address on the web on a website and get really detailed flood risk information for the the future to come, both near term and long term. Um, yeah, Thanks, I forget what it's called. That's, that, that's terrific. Um, there was one other audience question on sort of the cost benefit analysis, and I'll just uh, read it. So the various studies are starting to value potential enhancements from climate change readiness implementation of green infrastructure, rapid relocation of trees for heat island. Uh, do the models, and maybe Evan, this is for you, the models that are sort of looking at the ROI and net impact, um, do, they, do they debit for climate risk and credit for these enhancements? Do they provide any sort of upside value on the enhancement side? Yeah, so where we're, that's a great question. So where we're at right now is still sort of in the nascent stages of this. So, you know, when we think of the, the benefits for the most part, uh, what we can quantify uh, without any supplemental data or assumptions um, is along the lines of avoided costs or avoided damage uh, or avoided, you know, economic uh, downtime or impairment through GDP, avoided um, social population impacts, right? Um, but certainly with, um, with things like, so if you were going to, you know, greenify a space and uh, assume that you get uh, boost to tax rev uh, to, to the tourism revenue and tax revenue, for example, um, that's certainly something that could and should be folded in that type of analysis. Um, 
because that's just along the lines of the enhanced viability of, of, a, of a, you know, a local space um, given an adaptation metric, whereas you're not going to get those additional revenues or benefits if you don't have a protected area. So it, in short, yes. Can I follow up on that and also kind of help finish that the other question was, you know, the goal of the Climate Ready Boston plan is not necessarily to identify, well, it's definitely not to identify areas and say, okay, there's nothing we can do about these. The goal of the plan is to identify areas, really understand what our impact is so we can fix it. You know, our goal is to make sure that we remove areas from floodplain. Um, we're able to remove areas from floodplain when we get further along in the project. Um, I'm not the person to ask about property values because that's not necessarily my spot. What I will say is that prop, you know, property values are important to the city of Boston. They account, property taxes account for 70% of the city's revenue base. Um, and again, our goal is to make sure that we put the city on a path, we think it's on a path, but we keep it on a path of kind of long-term viability in the face of what we know is kind of rising sea level sea levels and kind of all the other host of challenges from uh, climate change, so. Um, great, uh, thank you. Um, one last question on transparency and then we'll close out. Um, since the, one of the critical links seems to be with the investment banks who are doing underwriting, um, this is a question about the degree to which the SEC is starting to integrate climate risk into their work. And, and I would note the, the kind of extraordinary op-ed in the New York Times, I think it was two days ago, by a Trump appointment to the SEC, specifically on this issue. Um, do, do any of you have a sort of a point of view about how climate risk will end up getting integrated into um, uh, the, you know, the way the SEC does its regulation? So let me just say from an issuer perspective, the requirements that are on us to disclose are sometimes quite vague. Uh, and often leaves it up to the issuer to determine what's material and what's not material. Now, there are different organizations that try to create benchmarks and give you guidance to determine what materiality is, but what's material to Boston may not be material to San Diego or, you know, Philadelphia or other cities. So I can tell you that the regulators are deadly serious about making sure that you appropriately disclose your material risks as far as giving you prescriptive information on how to do that and when to do that, I think that they generally tend to be hesitant to do because, you know, once you start being prescriptive and you miss something, that's a bigger problem. Uh, and so a lot of that is left to the uh, cities and towns and all the issuers to disclose appropriately. But I will say that if you ever get into a situation where you knew something and you didn't disclose it, it's a real problem. I mean, that's a very serious matter, so. And I just add quickly that I, I don't think the SEC um, tries to define what's material as much as they say, just make sure to Drew's point uh, that if it's material, you, it's got to be disclosed. But I would uh, point out also the initiative from uh, Mark Carney and the central banks about greening the financial system and stress testing the financial system itself for the impacts of climate. I think that's an interesting indication of how regulators and policymakers are, are keenly aware of the potential risks to the financial markets for um, of, of climate risk. Well, great, we've uh, come to the end and we'd like to um, end on time. I'd like to just thank the panelists for what a, what a, what a, what a great education uh, for all of us and a really, really complex uh, subject. And thanks to all the participants um, who, uh, who joined us. I'm sure this is not the last that we will um, hear about this topic and it's great to now have a sense of sort of how this, you know, dynamic is maturing and how fast it might mature. So um, thank you all and uh, thank you for joining us and hope to see you on the 14th of October. Take care. Thank you. Thank you, John.